So a few announcements for us real quick before we get started. Let's see here. We've got a sweet auction from last two weeks ago, maybe. If you haven't picked up, well, I guess you should have picked up your sweets. They should be already devoured by now. If they're not, they're no preservatives. They're all moldy. Uh, or you could have frozen them, as some I heard were doing. But you should pay for them if you haven't already. So please do so. And uh, please do that by this Sunday because that money uh, is destined for Youth Congress. Not this week, but next week. So thank you for putting that where it belongs, taking care of that. We're taking donations for Easter. And uh, if you would like to, this is for kids. Uh, we're going to do a glow-in-the-dark Easter egg hunt, and so it's going to be a lot of fun, and we need something to put in those Easter eggs because there's nothing worse than a uh, seven-year-old finding an empty Easter egg. They just don't get the same results out of it. So uh, if you'd like to donate bags, that's fine, bags of candy. Uh, money is better because we can, uh, they, they know what they're looking for, the folks that are doing this, and so uh, you can give it to Sister Jessie, or you can um, label uh, an offering envelope, put Easter um, candy on it, drop it in one of the boxes here or there. Of course, if you're online, you can also uh, just click the other um, slot on the drop-down menu for online giving, and you can put a note in there for that as well. So thank you for doing that. Uh, Easter's coming. Hoorah! In the uh, the Arab world, we would say uh, something like Happy Easter, and the response would be, He is risen. And so, He is risen. Uh, I was actually watching a, a comedian who was talking about Easter, and somebody yelled out from the audience, He is risen! And he was like, no, 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 that's called heckling, whenever you do that in the middle of a comedian's show. Don't heckle about Jesus. Uh, anyway, uh, just a random thought that just ran through, and I just grabbed it and ran with it. So, um, Easter's coming. Invite somebody. Uh, you can go to Facebook and grab our event and post it out if you want to do that. Uh, if you have somebody specifically that you want to hear from or you want to see, uh, send them a text message, give them a phone call, uh, drive by their house in the middle of the night and honk your horn real hard, whatever it takes to get their attention. Let them know that you'd like to see them uh, at uh, our Easter service. We're going to try something different this year. Uh, I don't know that we have ever done this since I've been around. Uh, we are going to do a sunrise service on Easter. And that is, uh, so that looks like a 6.30. Uh, there's already someone who's saying there's no way I'm coming to that. We're going, to, so, so sunrise is between 6.30 and 7 a.m. on Easter Sunday. So we are going to meet here in the, at the annex in the parking lot. We're going to do an outdoor service. It will be chilly, so dress warmly. Uh, so you can park here uh, and walk across over to the annex. So 6.30 a.m. on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday. Sunrise is supposed to be around 6.49 or so. We'll do about a 30-minute service. We'll do some a cappella music, just the way it was uh, in, the, in the New Testament. Uh, pastor will have uh, a short sermon that he will, uh, he'll preach, and uh, then you can go on your way. There is no requirement that you go to both services. Uh, you can come to the, the sunrise service and then not come to the 10 a.m. service. There's no expectation that you would attend both services, but obviously you are more than welcome. We were looking for a way to uh, alleviate some of the social distancing concerns that people may have, and so this is, a, this is an opportunity for you to do something different on Easter uh, and also uh, perhaps give us a little bit more space here uh, at the 10 o'clock service. So we will have two services on Easter Sunday, 6.30 a.m., in the annex parking lot, and then 10 o'clock here in the main sanctuary. So uh, feel free to pick one or both, uh, but not neither. 
just letting you just put that out there. All right. All right. I think that's all my announcements. If you haven't picked up a uh, Pentecostal life there in the, um, the foyer there, take one of those, take it home with you, and get some good stuff in your head. It's a good habit to be in since we're talking about habits. Uh, this month for our first focus uh, for this month, talking about your mind. And we'll be talking about body and spirit coming up in April and May. So uh, before we get started, let's go to prayer. Ask the Lord to help us tonight. Somebody have a prayer request. So we need to pray for Julie Morgan. She's recovering at home. Slow process, Slow process Sister Carol says. So we want the Lord to help her. So the, the infection is, is still dealing with that infection as well as the, the surgery that she had on her knee. So we want the Lord to help her with that. Somebody else have a special need you want to pray for tonight. All right. If you're online, I, I encourage you to just key that into us. Let us know what, what uh, we can pray with you about tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your help today. We thank you for bringing us together tonight to worship and to praise you, Lord, to give you uh, honor, because you are due exactly that. Lord, we thank you for all your good mercy and blessings in our lives. We ask you, Lord, specifically for uh, Julie Morgan right now. Pray, Lord, for you to touch her and minister to her. You see what is happening in her body, this knee, Lord, the infection that's set in. Lord, I'm asking you to dry it up right now. Lord, restore strength to Julie's body. Restore healing to Julie's body right now. We thank you for doing a good work in her. Lord, let that mobility come back quickly so that she can quickly get back on her feet. Lord, go about her life. We thank you for your good work in her in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for being with us tonight. Bless your word to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. All right, we are... Uh, I, I see this stuff, I just want to draw attention to our, our uh, focus for, uh, our prayer focus for this week is habits of your spirit, uh, as walking after the spirit, not after the flesh, so uh, asking the Lord to bring that up to you uh, throughout your prayer time, uh, throughout the day. Lord, I thank you for helping me have good habits so that I can walk after your spirit and resist the lust of the flesh in my life, so do that. All right, we're in Lesson 3 tonight, Faithful in Persecution. It's where we're headed, still staying in Revelation. Remember, we're working our way through the seven churches in the book of Revelation, so we're in Revelation 2 tonight, uh, talking about the mercy of God throughout this quarter. Our focus thought is that we need to remain faithful no matter what persecution we face. And our lesson text is out of Revelation chapter 2. We're going to read 8 through 11. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear not, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. He's talking about in the future tense. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation for ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. We're talking about persecution tonight. Throughout, um, regardless of, of what the the time frame is, throughout history, there has been persecution. It could be racial. Uh, it could be um, biased toward a very uh, individual sex, male or female. Tonight, of course, we're talking about religious persecution. Our country was founded by individuals who were looking for religious freedom, who were looking for the opportunity to worship as they saw fit for themselves. 
during a prayer time in a rural church in northeastern United States, a pastor asked some of his members if anybody had a need, just like we've done tonight. An elderly man mentioned that his backslidden children were mocking the beliefs that they once held to him. And a, a young professional was recounting how her company had reprimanded her for witnessing to a coworker at work. And then, of course, the congregation, just like we've just done, lifted up their voices and went to prayer. Those two individuals talking about persecution that they were experiencing. Other side of the world, another prayer meeting, another country, country hostile to Christianity, group of believers huddled together quietly in a basement, uh, in a house uh, service. Man says he's worried about his co-workers, suspecting that he was a Christian. He might be turned into the police. House pastor reminding uh, his, his small group of believers that they need to pray for a, a friend of theirs who had been caught with a Bible and that uh, their, his life was in danger. They go to prayer, praying that the Lord would have mercy and to protect them. A Western experience, an Eastern experience, both involving exactly the same thing, persecution. I, I know of, of my friends in the, in the uh, global missions field who are dealing with people on a regular basis uh, using very secure, encrypted forms of communication in order to uh, have Bible studies online so that no one can eavesdrop on them and they can do so safely because the area that they're in is very dangerous for them to have any interaction with Christianity. It only takes a, a, a quick Google search and you can find all kinds of uh, articles and uh, stories about various religious groups that are being persecuted around the world. It doesn't matter if it's Christians in Nigeria or if it's Uyghurs in China's uh, Xinjiang province, uh, if it's the Yazidis in Iraq uh, that were uh, had a terrible time uh, when ISIS came through Iraq, uh, and still there, this this whole group of this minority group of people is, uh, are are just decimated. Over the years, it seems that that persecution has just intensified. We went through a period of time where it felt like, well, you know, things are okay and people can kind of go about their business, but. I mentioned the, the, the Nigerian situation. Uh, houses are burned. Crops and fields are destroyed. Uh, villages are overrun. And as Christians, we have a mandate from the, from the Lord himself that we are to, to, to proclaim the gospel. It doesn't come with a caveat that says proclaim the gospel if you can. It doesn't say proclaim the gospel in a safe space. It says, proclaim, go into all the world, make disciples. And so our, our uh, sharing of the gospel in spite of persecution and, and, and praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters, uh, as they are in some cases clinging, just barely clinging to what the, uh, the word of the Lord has promised them, we, it's so important for us to, to keep them held up in prayer and in the opportunity given the opportunities uh, where we are given the opportunities to through various relief organizations uh, through giving to minister to those people who are desperately in need persecution comes in a lot of different forms uh, it can come as we as we began with with just some commentary some jokes I remember sitting in my office and one time and a group of people were standing outside my office. My office door was open. And they were talking about how terrible conservative Christians were. Just awful people. And I realize, like I'm sitting in my office, and these are friends of mine that I would sit together at meetings, and we would discuss various projects, and we would work closely hand in hand. And yet here they are standing in the hallway outside my office, not realizing that my door is open and I'm listening to every word that they're saying about how terrible 
my belief structure is and how my belief structure is um, probably going to bring the, the, the downfall of our nation. I remember vividly sitting at my desk with my hands on my keyboard Hmm. Well, this is an interesting situation. And instead of stomping myself out into the hallway and going, if I was talking about you like this, I would be fired. I simply said, Lord, you know. I'm going to let this go. Let this be. They would have never said that to my face. Never. Never. Persecution takes a lot of different forms. And in, and in times, it can cause us to question the Lord. And in here, whenever we talk about persecution here in the West, and whenever I say the West, I mean Western Europe, uh, the, 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 in North America, it is a very different experience than what people in Central and South America, Africa, Asia, the Middle East uh, experience. But it is still persecution. And any time that there's a little tweak to our stance, and whenever, whenever we are, uh, are, are um, we, we bump up against a little bit of an obstacle, and we, oh, well, what is that? I can't believe them. It's good for us to remember that the Lord said this is going to be normal. And, the, and, it, and it gives us just a taste, just a, this most smattering of, of perspectives of what people around the world are going through. The future of those that remain faithful is what we're focused on tonight. And this is what the Lord was saying to the church in Smyrna. Let's talk a little bit about Smyrna. It was a normal occurrence for believers to be persecuted in the city. This is modern-day Izmir, Turkey. Uh, why don't we throw up those seven churches slide? Let's see if what we've got here. Yeah. Last week we talked about Ephesus, and the seven churches of, of, of the book of Revelation refer to a specific group of churches on the western side of Turkey that fit into uh, everything all right there? The, every, the, that fit into this, this coastal area of the western side of Turkey. Ephesus, Revelation 2, they've labored hard, separated themselves. We've got Smyrna we're going to talk about tonight. Next week and a couple of weeks down the road, we're going to talk about Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And you can see here the different, uh, where those are laid out. And then at the top up there is Istanbul um, on the, the northwestern section of Turkey. And jump to the next slide there. I'll show you where Turkey is and the rest of the world. So you see where we are. This is Romania. This is the Black Sea up the center right there. This is the Mediterranean. You see the boot of Italy. Uh, you've got the Caspian Sea over here. Down below, we've got Cyprus. And then we get into Africa over here on the bottom left side of the, of the slide, Iraq, uh, Syria, Iran, of course, all those borders around Turkey. Bump to the next one. This, this zooms us in one more. And if you'll see this is where Ismar is over here. You see that, that red dot. That's the Aegean Sea. And you see Greece across the Aegean Sea from that. And this is just, that whole area is just tattered with islands all over, the, just some of them uninhabitable, and some of them very beautiful. Um, and so this whole coastal area at one point was Greece. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So that gives you a perspective. You can see the lines there of Turkey. And uh, Istanbul is the, is the corridor that gets into the Black Sea from the Aegean Sea, and that's actually the split. There's a bridge that crosses from Europe over to Asia. So as you cross south from Bulgaria uh, into Turkey, 
you cross from the European continent to the Asian continent. Uh, and that's a really cool experience to go from Europe to Asia just to cross that bridge. So Smyrna is about, you see where, uh, where Ismar is, this is, this is the, the current, the uh, modern day uh, name of the city. Smyrna is about 3,000 years old, at least that we know of. That's, that's what they have found as far as architecture or archaeological uh, finds. Um, there was a destructive, very destructive earthquake in uh, 178 AD, and it was rebuilt uh, in the second uh, century by the Romans. And uh, it changed hands over the years. The Greeks first, and then the Romans, and then the Turks. The Mongols actually invaded uh, this area, uh, tore down the, uh, the, the fort that the Crusaders were in. The Ottomans then, the, 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 the Ottomans kicked out the Mongols, and they took over from there. And uh, it kind of transferred back and forth until uh, World War I. And then the Greeks and the, and the Turks got into it using the chaos of World War I. And from 1919 to 1922, there was a, a Greek and Turkish uh, war that happened between those two groups. Remember Turkey, I said Turkey owned a lot of that area. This is, this is what uh, it looked like before, and now this is what it looks like today. What was so interesting was what... This happened in World War II also. There's a group of people who get together in an office with some nice snacks, probably some good drinks, coffee and tea, and they begin to carve up the world on a map. And so they made some decisions, just like they did in World War II. They made some decisions in World War I about how Greece and Turkey were going to figure this out. And 1.6 million Greek and Muslim Turks were literally transplanted. All the Greeks got pulled out and pushed across the sea. All the Muslims that were in Greece got pulled out and deposited in Turkey. They literally transplanted over a million plus people. And there were hundreds of thousands that died in the process. They, they, would, they just cleaned out whole villages. And so all, if you're Greek or you're Armenian, you leave. And if you got a problem with it, you die. In fact, there are villages to this day that no one will live in because of the massacres that happened in those villages. The Muslims coming in that were being transplanted refused to move into the villages because they, were, they said it was haunted by the, by the Greeks that were killed in these villages. And so it's a, it's a very war-torn, devastated area. Smyrna, at the end of this, 19, in 1922, at the end of this process, when all these refugees are trying to, to, to be transplanted, the Turks were going through burning Armenian and Greek homes. And it caught fire. The fire took hold and burned most of the city to the ground. And so what is left, what we see, uh, you can pop to the next one, this very modern city. I mean, check out those skyscrapers. This very modern city is built on the ruins of thousands upon thousands of years and very recent destruction. In fact, there's a very large park uh, that's similar to New York's, uh, New York City's Central Park that uh, is what is left of the city center that burned, and it's built on the ashes of what happened in 1922. We consider ourselves so civilized, don't we? And yet we are just the way the Mongols were. The Mongols burned the place to the ground. They actually used catapults and catapulted the bodies of the dead at the defenders. And we think, that's just, can you imagine the, the barbaricness of them? Or maybe we'll just have refugees on the docks burning to death because we set fire to the city. Persecution comes in all different forms. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. 
we actually have some of his writings. We have uh, Ignatius, uh, his, one of his students, uh, wrote a lot about him. He lived until uh, 155 A.D. It's very possible he was the, um, because he was from Smyrna, Smyrna was just across the bay from Patmos. And according to historians, uh, this is, we don't have anything biblically about this, but according to historians, it's very possible that Polycarp was taught by John himself, John the Revelator. And uh, much of the Roman Empire during John's time on Patmos was very hostile to uh, Christians in general. The persecution of Christians began to spread in the late first century uh, as the book of Acts was being uh, lived out before it was actually written by, by Luke. And so whenever this letter to Smyrna was written, uh, for the next, from this point to the next 200 years across the whole Roman Empire, it was a, it was a, it was a, a bloodbath for Christians specifically. And we don't, and here in North America, face that same kind of persecution that happened in the first century. We can look at what, what John wrote, quoting the Lord to Smyrna, and we can think about this from our perspective. We're not in the same position they were, but we can certainly use this as a promise that we can hold on to for ourselves, no matter what situation that we find ourselves in. Think about this, whenever I'm talking about some of these, these uh, things and these, these types of persecution, do you, what do you feel inside of yourself? Think about this, do you feel fear? Do you feel joy? It's a, it's a, a weird feeling to, to call out. Do you feel hopelessness? Imagine, put yourself in those people's shoes knowing full well that what you believe in your heart will eventually be your demise, your downfall, your death, your children's death? And how do you, how do you work with that? How, what emotion do you have in that? What the Lord is saying to the church in Smyrna is, I want to give you hope in the middle of this persecution. I don't want you to feel fear you're not wealthy by any stretch, but you are rich in what I am about to give you. You're rich in your eternal value. So why, am I, so why, why all this Roman persecution? Well, the Roman emperor was a god. Just like uh, the Japanese uh, in World War II uh, referred to their emperor as a, as a deity, the Roman emperor was considered a deity. And so it was... It was it was required, regardless of what your culture was, your religious belief structure, you worshipped the emperor of Rome. Whenever Rome came in and conquered your territory, your city, whatever, you switched allegiances or you died. And for most people, this was not a problem because they were polytheistic. And so they just added in the drop-down menu of gods today were Roman emperor plus Greek gods plus cultural gods plus uh, the unknown god. And so it was just, you just add another God to the list, and that's perfectly fine. But not so with the Christians, because they were monotheistic. And so it was, it, it was, it was impossible. There was no drop-down menu to add another God to. And so they have this, in, they have this um, inherent issue with worship that it makes them an anathema to the rest of the world around them. Nobody understood. Why, why, why wouldn't you do this? Well, I can't worship this God. Well, of course you can, just like you can worship your God. It doesn't work that way. And not only that, uh, it wasn't just the, the Romans that, were dealing, that they were dealing with, but it was the Jews as well. Because remember, the Jews believed that the belief in Jesus Christ as God was heresy. So not only do you have the Romans that you're dealing with, but you also have your own, in some cases, your own cultural family who are giving you not just grief, but they are turning you in. Oh, this is a perfect opportunity for us to get rid of them. Even though they were in the same position, they weren't worshiping, worshiping the emperor. Now, they, they worked out some very, very coy legal ways of making their world work. Because they, they made it very hard on Rome to rule over them. 
And so there was some little give and take that happened. And the Jews used this as a, uh, as a, a perfect opportunity to wipe out. This is what happened with Saul. He was doing, he was rolling that, that ball down the court because he knew he could use the Romans as an excuse to violently attack Christians. Now, of course, Saul's story ended a little bit better than it began. But this oppression, this attack on Christianity was legalized by Rome and pursued by the Jews. In, uh, in 312 AD, uh, the Roman Emperor, Emperor Constantine had a vision that he claimed uh, gave him a conversion experience. And there's some back and forth as to whether or not he really understood what he was getting into, but regardless of how or what he truly believed, it did take the pressure off of Christianity. It gave us some really cool things, kind of like uh, if, if when you go to Jerusalem, Lord willing, you'll all have the opportunity to do so before it becomes new again. The uh, gives some appreciation of what was there before. Uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher was built by Constantine uh, over what was supposed to be what was traditionally held as uh, the tomb of Jesus, or what was Golgotha. And so whenever you go there uh, to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, uh, that original building was built hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And so the, illeg- the illegality of Christianity was removed, but what then happened was we have this growth that is experienced and it's growth in sex. So we have the Orthodox Church, we have the Catholic Church, and then we have all different kinds of little things that pop up. Everybody has their own belief structure because the Roman Empire was very large, and it became what we have today, where you have all these little doctrinal differences between different groups that splintered off from each other as people got upset over colors of songbooks or pew distances or whatever the case may be. Even today, at this very moment, on the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, there is a ladder that has been sitting there, and I can't remember the exact time frame. Somebody can look it up. But the la- there's a ladder leaning against a wall on the second or third story outside that one church, because there's multiple churches that are represented there, one group of monks put it up there to reach to a window, and another group of monks got angry at them, and they have not been able to remove it since, and it's been up there for hundreds of years. Imagine, Harold, you cannot move the rake out of your yard because I'm angry at you. And so the rake stands, and David comes by, and he says, why can't we move the rake? No, don't touch the rake. This is Scott and Harold's issue. And so 50 years down the road, the rake still stands because Scott's family and Harold's family can't get together on who's going to move the rake. I know it sounds a little, really? Just take the thing down. But literally, the cops have to come in. The Israeli police, the Jewish Israeli police have to come in and separate the Orthodox and the Catholics and all these different groups because they'll, they're, they're marching this direction around the building and these groups marching this direction and their two feasts collided and they didn't get the memos right. And now we've got a, 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 a brawl. Incense is getting whipped everywhere. People are getting whacked with candlesticks. And it all started in 312 A.D. Heretics becomes the common description of those who didn't quite get the memo on what I believe. So we'll burn you, or we'll persecute you, or we'll kick you out, or we'll whatever in order to make sure that my belief gets promoted. Constantine was the one who brings the Nicene uh, Creed to be uh, into existence. He's the one who uh, locks in the the, the, the culture of the Trinity and it's very possible that there were those who, in, who were oneness, who did not uh, agree with the doctrine of the Trinity, that were persecuted in the midst of this process. 
300 years after the birth of Jesus. You know, it's one thing to say you're going to face suffering, you're going to face imprisonment, you're going to face death. It's pretty bold to say don't fear any of those things. You're going to suffer really bad stuff. Don't worry about it. Well, it's easy for you to say, you're over on all of Patmos over there writing this stuff down. You're kind of lonely, but you're all right. We're going to talk about him in just a second. He, had the, he was the perfect person to give this kind of, uh, of encouragement to these, these believers, some of them who were brand new in their faith. Some of them had been doing this for a long time. He's in the Isle of Patmos. This is not this is not in the scripture, but according to some historians, uh, the the emperor at the time, Domitian, had John boiled in oil in the in the middle of a coliseum full of people, and the story is that he was preaching the entire time. Now we don't know if he was not injured or if he simply survived it. But the story is that the entire Colosseum converted to Christianity on the spot. Watching this, we're here to see somebody die, and lo and behold, he lives. And so the, the emperor was like, well, if I can't kill him this way, we gotta, I don't, what do we do with this guy? Get rid of him. And so they banish him to Patmos. Historians say that, that uh, the mission... The, the emperor eventually died, and after that, he was allowed to come back to the mainland, and he actually died uh, either in Smyrna or in Ephesus. Um, because the scriptures don't go that far out. We don't have that in, in scripture, but we have some of those things from historian, uh, historical writings. What do you do with a guy you can't kill? Get rid of him. And then he finds himself in the spirit on the Lord's day. Horrible persecution, comes out on the other side successfully, but it doesn't mean that he wasn't well acquainted with their experience. He knew what they were going through, and John's faith in, who he, in whom he had believed was not changed. And so he was the perfect person as a living, breathing physical testimony of God's faithfulness in the worst of situations. He was the one who wrote, John, uh, pulled John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you that you might have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I wonder while he was walking into the Colosseum, was he thinking, yeah, the Lord said, I need to be of good cheer. So do you dance your way to the boiling oil? That's what, that's what that says. Comfort whenever we're comfortable. Gratitude whenever we are in a place to be casual. But when we're in the middle of the trial, how many of you want to have somebody come to you and pat you on the back while you're changing the tire in the middle of a hailstorm and say, the Lord says, be of good cheer. <laughs> Kick them out to the center line and hope there's a semi going by. And yet, this is what Smyrna is all about. You are suffering for my name's sake. Hang in there. Be faithful in the middle of it. We talked about this about, about the, 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 the persecution they were facing. And the Lord specifically mentions their poverty. And it could be that their situation, they couldn't work because they were Christians. If you're not going to, whenever you walk into our establishment, bow before the image of the emperor, then you can't come in. If you're not going to offer incense to the God that I serve, you can't work for me. This is what this looks like. And there were times whenever Paul would, was saying, uh, whenever he was traveling, uh, he was taking up offerings for the people who were living in Jerusalem because they were in a very bad situation. There was a, uh, there was a famine going on. Uh, they were in a, in a bad place. Uh, 
it's very possible that their persecution could have come from a systematic oppression, both in the marketplace, I'm not selling to Christians, and also uh, because of their economy, which limited their opportunities to, I, I'm not going to give you ground to, to plant seed in. I'm not going to give you a place to bury your dead. Persecution. Whenever we start talking about it like this, and, and we look back over our history, and even in our own country, and we see that the, the way that different uh, language groups, different cultures have been treated in our country, uh, all the way back to the beginning. Now imagine that being a religious situation. Absolutely exists, even right now, March of 2021. And then he says, you're rich. You're rich. Well, that's rich. I'm rich. Right. Yes. Find that attitude of gratitude. He says, the blasphemy, this is 2 and 9, uh, the blasphemy of those which say they are Jews but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. That same whitewashed sepulcher kind of language that Jesus used whenever he was physically on earth is the same. Ugh, he had no, I, I'm not going to uh, take it from these, uh, this type of, of, of person, this hypocritical, pharisaical type of person. They have, they've crossed the line into the demonic. They're tools of Satan. Not just wicked speech toward the believer, the individual, but it was because it was ultimately speaking against who? It was a child of God. And when you take on a child of God, you're taking on him. You talk about my kids, you're going to deal with me. Remember, we face persecution today. It doesn't matter how tame it is. It doesn't matter how backhanded it is. Remember, they're not taking you on. Because if you are representing in righteousness the authority of God Almighty, remember, that just pass, that's just a pass-through account. You just happen to be a conduit going straight to heaven. We'll let the Lord deal with you. And in the process, you have to learn how to say, Lord, I'm going to ask you to forgive me. Hmm. Polycarp, whenever he was being burned at the stake, asked the Lord to forgive and said, I'm so grateful that I have the opportunity to share in the suffering of my Savior. Polycarp, for, in, for, for, for that situation, they couldn't get the, the fire to light, and they ended up having to stab him to death. grateful to be able to share in the suffering of my Savior. The Lord told them, it's not over. You're going to face more persecution. He said you're going to be thrown in prison. You're going to be tested. That means tortured. You're going to be tried. You're going to go to court. One thing leads to another. There's no end in sight. And there's no rationale for what's going on. And he says, again, we have to remember, get yourself a t-shirt. I have overcome this world. Be of good cheer. I've overcome this world. This is also the reason that some of these the, the, things like prosperity gospel is, is just borderline heresy. Yes, are we blessed? Did he not say to the church in Smyrna, you're rich? But he's not saying you're rich in Lambos and second houses and country estates. And so whenever people grasp a hold of prosperity, doctrine, that God wants the very best for you and you're going to be wealthy beyond your wildest expectations, and then they face persecution, their faith becomes brittle. And it breaks under that weight because they're expecting God. Why? I thought you were going to bless me, and here I am. No, uh-uh. You're going to have tribulation. Be happy about it. Go. I'm done with you. No. 
I, I was supposed to be rich right now. Where's my car? Mm -mm, no. He promises blessings. He promises good people, good things. But we know that those things are not of this world because we are not of this world. We're faithful to him because he's faithful to us, and we're faithful to him through whatever comes our way. Blessings, pain, suffering, whatever it might be. His only admonishment to them was to be faithful. And what does that faithful look like? This is what the writer of Hebrews says. Substance of things what? Hope for. I don't see the prosperity. I don't see the riches. What am I doing? I'm having faith for the future. I'm not expecting it right now, but I know because I have faith in whom I have believed. I believe he's faithful to me, and he is my substance. He is the evidence of what I have not seen. And the better times that we're hoping for are not in this world. Because if you have hope in this world only, what are you? Most miserable. Oh, my goodness, so miserable. Jesus in Luke 18 tells a story of the widow woman who didn't know how to give up. She was, I mean, you talk about overbearing. I mean, she was in that judge's face, oppressed, mistreated. Nobody's going to give her justice. And she's constantly going back. I know what my right is. I deserve justice. And this is what faith, true faith looks like. I know where my faith is. I know what is right, and I'm not going to give it up. And God help us if he tarries. Every one of us are going to have that opportunity to say, I know what's right, and I'm not giving it up. It's difficult for us sitting in this central Missouri space to think about those doors being locked and not one of us in this room having a key. It's difficult for us to fathom what that looks like. But in that moment... When it happens, we pull out of the parking lot and we lift our hands and we worship the Lord. Now, I'm not speaking prophetically. I'm telling you what you will do in order to exemplify the faith of substance of things hoped for. Lord, I thank you that you're still on the throne. Lord, I thank you that you haven't changed, even though the laws of the land that I live in have. Lord, I thank you that you are still in control and that my faith is in you alone. Lord, you're going to provide for me today and tomorrow, and I'm not going to change my faith in whom I have believed. And you have to decide in the moment that you are sitting in the comfort of this world that you are in currently, that no matter what happens, I will believe. Because given the opportunity, you will give up. If, you, if your faith is brittle. Jesus, at the end of that story, the, 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 the widow woman says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on this earth? Regardless of what you believe, pre, post, or, or mid-trib, you better have your faith in order. Because what he's looking for is not people who had good intentions. He's looking for those who have faith. And faith means I have not bowed. Put yourself in the three Hebrews children's position. They were the ones who got picked out. We don't know if there was anybody else stand, still standing. Maybe they were the only ones. I don't know. Maybe some people called in sick and didn't come in. They abstained that day. And maybe the Hebrew guys just said, you know what, we're going to go. We're going to show up for work. And we're just going to stand. Their faith said, I believe in what I have not seen. I have not seen my salvation from this situation yet. But I believe that he is able to do it.
That is what faith, that's the faith that Luke 18, 8, the Lord is looking for in us. So think about this. These are things that you need to think about. We prepare for all kinds of things. When we get a snowstorm coming, we go buy all the milk we can find and all the loaves of bread we can find so that we can make sure that we've got enough peanut butter sandwiches and we can make French toast. That's the only thing I can figure is happening. There's no bread, no eggs, no milk. Bunch of people making French toast during the snowstorms. What are some practical ways that you can remain faithful? What are some ways that you can start now? And I'll, I'll give you a hint. It starts with mind, body, and spirit. Practical ways to remain faithful in the midst. What are the things that you need to keep doing? How can you help each other stay faithful? Encouragement. Hang in there, bro. You're having a rough day today. I believe you can do this. Begin now. This is why we're talking about first focus all this year is so that you have those habits in your life already. So whenever you get up in the middle of the night or the next day and everything has changed a la 12 months ago, it doesn't change you. We just stripped away everything you know. You realize this. It's 12 months ago. We're on the anniversary of this. Everything changes. And what happens to your faith? Does it falter? Or do you say, I have already planted an anchor in the middle of my life. I have an altar built and I have a hold of his hand. And he's not changed. I haven't changed because my faith is in him. Whenever I change, that means my faith has been changed. My, my, my focus, my faith focus has changed. The Lord tells the church in Smyrna, your tribulation is going to last for 10 days. Do not, please do not take that as a literal 10 days. It took 10 days for that message to get to them. Was it a space of time? I, 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 I feel badly for those, if, if they, they translated that differently, they're like, well, it's only going to be 10 hours. Well, okay, well, we should be good here. When did he write this? I think like six days ago. Oh, we should be fine. Why are we still getting persecuted? 10, we see 10 later on in the book of Revelation. There's 10 horns on the beast. 10 simply represents a period of time. But what does it represent? A finite period of time. He doesn't say you're going to be persecuted forever. He says 10 days. You can, you can just, just know this is not forever. This is not going to last forever. You're going to make this through. And be faithful unto death. Sometimes, and don't get freaked out, but the, the release from your persecution is death. And I... I God bless those, and he does, who have given their lives for the gospel. But I pray if I'm in that situation that I say, would you hurry up and light that fire because i got places to go. This is going to hurt for a minute, but it's finite. i got 10 days to deal with you, and then I never have to see your face again. In fact, do you want to come with me? Because you don't want to miss this. Do you know that there were people who were testifying to their persecutors as they were dying, torturing them, trying to get them to confess, to, 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 to rescind their confession of, of faith in Christ? If you would just believe with me, you can have eternal life. Do you know what that takes? That takes altars, anchors, and faith faithfulness. And he says, I'm going to give you a crown of life. We, we always talk about the, the we're going to get a crown. What's that? Put another star in my crown. Praise the Lord. It was not a crown. It was the wreath, the laurel wreath that the runner who won the race received. 
It was the ultimate prize. Overcoming avoids the second death, that death in eternity. If in this life we have hope only. Miserable people, miserable people. But this is what Paul was saying in 1 Thessalonians. You need to comfort yourselves. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, be comforted. Be comforted. Be comforted. You have a promise. And this promise means regardless of what you face on earth, regardless of what you experience, whether it's your family or it's the government or it's your employer or employees, your coworkers, whatever it is, it's finite one and two, he's faithful. So maintain your faithfulness, and nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he's going to have faith. He's going to find faith right here, right here. You establish it in yourself. Stand with me tonight. Establish it yourself. Lord, it's, you're going to find faith in this house right here. Lord Jesus, I thank you today that we can find our blessing and strength in your hand. Lord, that your wing has overshadowed us. Lord, we testify, every one of us in this house, testify of your faithfulness to us. You have never left us. You have never forsaken us. Lord, we hold to your promise that you will be with us. And we confess joyfully our faith in you today. Lord, our faith in you is strong. It is stable. Lord, we thank you for being our helper in every situation that we find ourselves in. I thank you for giving us the opportunity today, Lord, to restore and to strengthen our faith in you. Lord, that we would develop habits of prayer and worship and gratitude in you, not in this world, but in our eternal value through you, Lord Jesus. Our salvation is secure because we know who we have believed. Lord, we thank you for being our strength. Help us, Lord, to be a blessing and to, to encourage those around us. Lord, to be, let their faith be strong. We give you all the praise and the glory. Come soon, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Be faithful. We'll see you this weekend in Jesus' name.